after writing two transformational books myself and supporting many other beings to do the same, I've become enthralled by the deep and mysterious magic that's activated when we choose to say yes to ourselves and commit to the book writing journey. Of course, we want to inspire change and new perspectives in our readers, but the transformation that happens as an author, both throughout the writing process and by actually releasing your book into the world is surprisingly potent. I know I've been blindsided in the most disruptive and delicious ways by some of the changes my books have brought into my life. Writing a book is like casting a spell. Although we can never be completely sure what's going to be unleashed during the process, we choose to do it anyway. This Unbound One is a heroic journey. Each book has the potential to be a magical portal, a doorway to a new world, both for you and your reader. Each book has a very specific medicine that it's here to share with us. And each book gives us the opportunity to alchemize the magnificent imperfection of our experience into gold. The truth is that anyone can write a book. We could all get a few thousand words down and put them together. But what fascinates me is what happens when we allow the book writing process to go deeper. When we say, fuck it, get naked and dive way down beneath the surface letting go of the shoulds and any need to be acceptable, sensible or approved of. What fascinates me is what happens when we make ourselves fully available to being transformed by the very act of writing a book. This is Unbound Writing and this is the process we'll be exploring together here in the Unbound Writers Club. I'm Nicola Humber, author and founder of The Unbound Press, and I help magical beings to write the transformational book they're really here to write at this time. I'm your guide here in The Unbound Writers Club, and the aim of this podcast is to help you to feel supported, encouraged, activated as you embark on your book writing journey. Whether you're a first-time author or have many books out in the world, my hope is that you will find something here to inspire you. Let's dive in. Hello and welcome to the Unbound Writers Club. Today I am joined by one of our brilliant authors at the Unbound Press, Sarah Wheeler. Sarah's first book, Shadow and Rose, came out last year, and her second, Enough, Healing from Patriarchy's Curse of Too Much and Not Enough, is out now. You need this book in your life. As it says on the back cover, Enough is for every woman who has tiptoed the invisible line between believing she is either too much or not enough, or both. And I feel like we have definitely all had that experience probably on a daily basis. So like I said, we all need this book in our lives. If you haven't met Sarah before, she's an all-round advocate for women recovering from the wounds of patriarchy in so many different ways. She's a Reiki and yoga teacher, obviously an author and founder of Your Enough Yoga in Hove, East Sussex. That's where she's based. And at the end of our conversation, I actually forgot to ask Sarah how you could connect with her and find out more about her work. Totally going to blame that on my menopausal brain fog. So let me give you those details now so that you have them. Her website is youreenoughyoga.com. That's all one word, youreenoughyoga.com. Or you can find her on Instagram. And her handle over there is Your Enough Yoga by Sarah Wheeler. We will make sure that all of the details are in the show notes for you. And without further ado, let me introduce you to Sarah. So Sarah, welcome back to the Unbound Writers Club. Hey, (laughs) thank you so much. It's, It's good to be back. In the club with my comfy chair, cup of tea, your lovely face. Yeah, and it is so good to be celebrating enough, making its mm-hmm. way, making her way into the world. So I can't wait to dive into like, everything surrounding this book. But first, you know, I always start with the same question and I am curious to know, because I know I've asked you this before, but what does it mean to you right now to be an unbound writer? Mm, it means 
giving so many less fucks than what I have done up until now, this point in my life. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that I had a different answer about that when when we had our podcast about first book, Shadow and Rose. But that, you know, that sentiment is still very much underneath it. And I think that's been with me a long, like a long time, particularly, you know, you grow up, you mature, you do different things in your life. Like you somehow become a writer, even though you're like, oh, I've got absolutely no formal experience or training of how to do anything like this. It just appears to be happening. And then I think coming at the other side of, of bringing out book number two, it does help you get to know yourself again as a person who's like, yeah, fuck it. Like I can do that. I could do it again if I wanted. I might not. I don't know. But it's there and I can. And I think, yeah, as well, like the unbound thing, I'm pretty sure I did say this before, was it's so much self-given permission to be doing what you want to do for the reasons that you want to do it. Like if you want to open a Shetland pony farm because you really like Shetland ponies and you want to learn about them and you've never done that before in your life, Go and do that because it will probably be super duper fulfilling. You know, if you want to write your book, start getting out scrappy pieces of paper and then get a nice notebook and then get your laptop and just do it (laughs) because you can and you can give yourself permission to do the things that you want to do when you want to do them under the circumstances and timescale that works for you, not for somebody else. Mm, Amazing. Are you going to be opening a Shetland Pony Centre? I'm not. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm not that was just a random example that I picked out of the air however <laughs> I do love little Shetland ponies so you know if I ever had a small fault holding one day I'd never say never but not for now okay we're not we're not <laughs> ruling it out but you know not ruling it out not ruling it out <laughs> just not right now <laughs> oh so tell us tell us some more about enough like what what called you to write this specific book Mm. she enough healing from patriarchy's curse of too much Mm. and not enough is the full title she was really born out of me writing and kind of curating my first book which was called shadow and rose a soulful guide for women recovering from rape and sexual violence so I, i was writing shadow and rose and that was actually in itself quite a quick writing process in terms of me just getting everything kind of out of me that I wanted to put down and then the actual formulating it into some kind of coherent book was like a longer thing and and that came later but in both the the writing from like from my heart from my belly from out of my body writing Shadow and Rose it kept kind of turning into like other little bits of exploration that I was doing and I think probably other writers whether you know they they write through unbound or not i'm sure a lot of people would resonate with the fact that when you think you start right when you're starting writing about one thing by the end you probably ended up writing about something else and it isn't necessarily that that thing you're writing about at that end is going to end up in the piece that you think you've started writing it's a bit of a roundabout way of me saying that so essentially, I ended up with all these notes about different things that were still heavily connected with what it is to be a woman, heavily connected with recovering the bits of ourselves that can get really lost in life. Lost because things happen to us that we wouldn't choose to have happen. But those things that can then happen can have us see things about ourselves and our inner strength that maybe we wouldn't have seen before. And they also open our eyes to different aspects of life that we wouldn't have been able to have a look into had we not been through those really challenging circumstances. Um, So as a person, when I was writing, curating and just doing my notes for Shadow and Rose, obviously the, the topic of that book was to do with recovery from rape and sexual violence. It led me to be writing about things that are so on the topic of recovery, but not necessarily that thing. So recovery from this kind of endemic problem that women have, which is always being, oh, what's that phrase? Like always having your kind of ducks in a row or like always having things like lined up, like looking like you know what you're doing. And this is something that men do as well, you know, like always feeling that you kind of got to bring your A game to stuff. And that comes from a, you know, a long history of schooling, which is so common for many of us, which is, you know, you're taught to give 100%. 100% of the time 
And it's like, well, a hundred percent is a, you know, that's an inf, not infinite. That's a, um, that's a finite amount. Mm. So if it's finite, you've got nothing left. Exactly. <laughs> what are you supposed to do? <laughs> like, oh, I've given a hundred percent. There's nothing left over here. Mm -hmm. um so yeah recovering from our patterns of always giving never having enough left for ourselves and that being said always giving to the wrong people so maybe there's people in our lives that we've come into difficult and you know toxic relationships with who we and we end up trying to give to those people because as good little girls who are very trained by patriarchy Mm -hmm. to think oh if I love them more they'll change yeah if I do more things for them they'll change if I could only see things from their perspective, then they will change. If I say enough affirmations or prayers or do enough law of attraction work, maybe that person will change. And I do, I do hate to be the breaker of bad news, but it's not because if you are in a toxic relationship and it's toxic to you because it's bad for your health, <laughs> that's why I say toxic. Mm-hmm. The person that you're in that relationship with, they're not going to change, but you'll end up as the person who's with them, you'll end up turning yourself inside out, trying to change to make that relationship work. So all of these topics were finding their way out of me talking and writing about recovery from from abuse as in sexual violence. And then it had me think about, not that I even really wanted to think about, but go into those areas of my life where I'd been like, there has been emotional abuse. There has been narcissistic abuse. Mm-hmm. There has been abuse within workplaces and high demand groups, to call it what it is, cults that unfortunately I've been involved with and have now extricated myself from. All of those systems were set up to take away a set of person's sense of enoughness. And I kept coming back to that every time that I'd write my notes and I'd go off topic for Shadow and Rose and come back and be like, that's for later. Um, so yeah, that's how Enough was born. She was born out of something else, which was a book that I needed to write at that time and to let her make the difference she wanted to make. And then it was like her sister started to evolve as well. And that's enough. Fantastic. Oh, I love hearing you speak about that and the relationship between the two books, because I feel like, you know, it'd be so powerful to be able to read both books like together like they mm. have this relationship with each other people might come to one first and then think oh actually I feel really cool yeah to Shadow and Rose or vice versa so yeah 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 definitely vice versa I don't think it matters like what there isn't an order and I think that's one of those things about <laughs> unbound writing as well it's like oh, you started over there and you're not, you know, don't think you're going to go from A to B to C because you're not, you're going to go to like Z and then come back. Yes, <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you, you pick up whichever of those two books that you happen to find and then maybe there's there's ideas, there's nuances that then get echoed in the next book if a person wanted to explore them on, on that topic of recovery and yeah, just taking power back in your life. Totally. Totally. That's the theme, isn't it? Like the overriding theme. And you talk about, like, obviously the book's called Enough and you know, it's healing, patriarchy's curse of not enough, but also the too much piece is really mm. interesting as mm. well. Yeah. I can't speak for every woman and it's in the last thing I'd want to do to be putting words into people's mouths or thoughts that aren't true for them because we have to come to our own, we have to come to our relationship of knowing ourselves in the way that's actually authentic to us. Like not just because somebody else says one thing and it's like, oh, that's definitely me. It's like that that might not be. <laughs> you know, it takes a bit of time to kind of get with ourselves and know if somebody else's truth is our truth as well. That's a long way of me saying though. I'm sure that lots of people, women, will have had an experience where they felt like they're too much in life. Mm -hmm. And it's like a swinging pendulum between believing that you're not enough and then believing that you're too much. And I have definitely experienced in my life feeling like I'm a fucking square or round peg that has to go in a hole that's the opposite way and it doesn't fit. Mm. (laughs) And you're like, oh okay, well, I guess I'm to this for that person or to that for that thing or not enough of that for that job. And if I'm not enough of this, it probably means that I'm too much like that and and yada, 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 and so on and so forth until you wrap yourself into a knot. I've wrapped myself up in knots trying to like shapeshift into being ways that people want me to be, you know, going back into unhealthy 
relationships, for example, and being in situations that you think you should be in that you actually don't need to be because you think that that's what's expected of you. Yes, <laughs> too much and not enough. I think, you know, there's there's so much kind of reflections of those topics in life. And they even go back far, far, far back in time into some of the most like ancient yogic or tantric scriptures as well. Mm. There's stories that are written in the mythology about two demons. Sometimes they're called two generals in a story about some of the gods. And um, they're called Chanda and Mudra and like loosely those um, Munda, sorry, not Mudra, Chanda and Munda. Their names translated are too much and not enough. Oh, so wow. we're going back thousands and thousands of years that women and men and everybody have been bugged by this problem and this, where do I fit? Who do I get to be on this sliding scale of too much and not enough? Mm. Oh, I, I didn't know that. That's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? It's um, I, I know that because it's part of the mythology, which is to do with the original story or myth of, um, of Yoga Nidra. Mm. And how that practice became a practice that's to do with rest, about sleep, but um, you know, started off as a story which was to do with the goddess, who's the it, the the name is Yoga Nidra of the goddess, oh. and she's called on to come and wake up one of the gods from his slumber, so that he can go and do the stuff that he needs to do, but it's only her that can help him awaken. So then we've got this incredible. Oh, what's that word I'm looking for? Not alchemical, that archetype of feminine and the feminine who is the life giver. She's the energy giver. She's the person that can bring the God out of his slumber so that he can do what he needs to do. And in the background is this woman who isn't being in the background. She's being called upon to step into the foreground because life can't happen without her. Mm, wow. Yeah. Oh. That's like a really powerful context for the book, actually. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So not only is it in the story of Yoga Nidra, it's in different um, tantric stories as well. And in part of the book, it's in the final, um, I think the penultimate chapter, which is called Power. Mm. And I was talking with a really amazing coach and tantra teacher, Eastern Tantra. Her name's Kathy Rowan, and her details are in the book we were sharing about what it is to talk about feminine power. And then we had this deep dive of a conversation where we were like, oh, the feminine is power. It's not feminine power. Mm. She is the power. She's the life giver. She's where it all starts. Therefore, it's all wrong and upside down in patriarchy because patriarchy is an inverted system that wants to treat the very thing that gives us life badly. So we and Kathy are chatting, we're talking about, um, she's telling me, and I'm sitting there like listening open mouthed about these stories that talk about these, these uh, not opposites, but polarities that slide in scale. And one of those things is too much and not enough on, on that slide in scale. And then she starts talking about Chandan and Mundra again. And I'm like, I know them. <laughs> they just turned up in a different story, but still to do with, that dilemma, that dichotomy between is it this or is it that? Am I too much or not enough? Mm. Where do I get to actually stop that, intervene in it and say, I'm enough and I'm not too much? Or we can flip it again and be like, yeah, okay, you might think that I'm too much, but I'm the exact right amount for myself. Totally. And just bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> bring it mm -hmm. on <laughs> uh, I'm curious actually with those two kind of aspects like not enough too much did that show up in your writing I mean I know very often both of those <laughs> both ends of the spectrum show up very much in the writing process so yeah that for you oh with yeah definitely I don't know if I can think of a specific example right now but it was for sure something that pervaded lots of the process mm. around enough being written, cooked up, alchemized, formulated. And then, you know, the, the later stages of, of the, the technicalities around bringing the, actually bringing the book out. Yeah. Yeah. There was definitely times in, in their sort of end stages of like, 
I am not enough equipped to be able to understand things to do with technology that I could really do with understanding. Yes, let me go and learn a little bit. And let me go and learn a little bit without beating up on myself for the fact that I didn't know it in the first place. Because if you don't know it in the first place, you can't be calling yourself not enough because it's not your fault that you didn't know it if no one's ever told you. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. See how we just wind ourselves around these patterns of like, not enough, not enough, not enough. Oh, I didn't know. Therefore, I'm not enough. It's like, no, you didn't know. So you didn't know. Exactly. That's the end of it. Like, you've never yeah. done it before. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, and for sure, too much, too much when you notice, and I'm, I guess like other writers are going to talk about this too, when you notice like you're self-censoring when you're writing and like you read, you write something out and you're like, oh no, can't say that word. Better swap that word for that word because it's just going to be too much otherwise. And I don't want to scare people. And I don't, I don't want to scare people. I don't want to alienate people. But actually what I do want to do is put across the the, the realness of what I wanted to write at the time that I wanted to write it. Mm. Um, and it, you know, definitely brings up thoughts, memories of teachers in school getting their red pen and red penning all through your work and it's like yeah that works for an exam because you're judged on can you be to the point can you make your point without just going off on one on some mad tangent and that's relevant at that time because that's what you're being assessed on but life isn't trying to assess you on that and your relationship with yourself doesn't need to be assessed about how little red pen like you can put through your own writing because I think like if you're journaling he wants to red pen through their journaling. Like your journaling is the words that come out of your body and your heart and they didn't need to be a red pen there. No. I think what's really good about how books, the two books that I brought out with Unbound and how the editing process works, for sure that, you know, the people are there to help you tidy up your work, to help you with maybe a bit of grammar along the way, to help you express, express something in a way that might be more cogent than how you've said it and to make sure that those words land with, with the reader. But it's never felt like I've been, read, been being red penned. And I think that can often be something that maybe puts people off writing is like, I wasn't very good at that in school or I wasn't, you know, I don't have like a formal creative writing degree or anything like this. And it's like, get your pen sit right and it's enough totally totally and I love the way you speak you've you've used the phrase a couple of times um during this conversation like really writing from your body like the words come from your body and I wonder if that's something because we're definitely not taught to write like that <laughs> definitely uh-uh. not so did that come quite naturally with both the books or is that something you've cultivated bit of both I think I think it's definitely one of those ones where like two truths or two situations are are, like true at the same time I think a recovery process from sexual violence which was obviously the topic of the first book Shadow and Rose during that process of recovery before I even considered that I might be writing a book at any stage it was a recovery and a process of embodiment Mm. and for me that meant getting back into my body after the stress and the shock of boundaries being broken and of violation and you know in any kind of trauma event there's a little bit of us that gets lost and kind of jumps away and so putting all of us back into ourselves it doesn't mean that we have to be the same person as how we were before the thing there might be changes that happen and those changes are probably you know indicative of us becoming more whole when we get back into our bodies because You've been through a difficult thing, whatever it is, loads of shit difficult things happen to people in life. But to come back into embodiment is being like, I've now got a sense of where I am in my body. I've kind of got like a locus of where I'm coming from and I can actually feel where my body is at any particular place. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, before going through those times of sexual violence and having met scenarios in life that weren't good for me, I was already coming to that place of, non-embodiment if you will so I think that process that that I kind of stepped into as as recovery which I did under really really good guidance of very skilled practitioners who were helping me with a trauma therapy called eye movement desensitization and re I always forget if it's reprogramming or re um, reprocessing EMDR for sure 
it's not a therapy where you're necessarily talking a lot about the the difficult thing or the trauma that happened to you it's led by your body and what responses come up in the body that you then happen to articulate as you speak. And they might be nothing to do with what you went to the quote unquote, what you go to the therapy session for. It becomes about something else, but all at the same time, there is reprocessing and, and recalibration of the nervous system, which has become fractured and non-embodied, shall we say. And then we get to learn how to live back in a sense of harmony, which isn't always harmonious because that's the nature of trauma. That's the nature of reco um, recovering and kind of rebalancing the nervous system. We get to a place within ourselves where it's like, when I pick up my pen to write, I feel like I'm not just writing from my head or what the mind's trying to give me. It's coming from somewhere else. You could say that that's body. You could say that that's higher self. I happen to think that higher self is your body, you yeah. know? And it's like, oh, some people say like, oh, is that higher mind? And I'm like, oh, your mind isn't just related to your head. Like your mind is everywhere. It's all through you. It's in your connective tissue. It's in your energy field. It's in every little tiny nook and cranny of yourself. That's where memory lives. Not so much up in the brain that, you know, there's a lot of scientific research now to show that our memory is held in the body. So in a way, when we can get quiet and come to write about those things that really matter to us, we, we can't help but write in an embodied fashion because we're sending our memory out of our body into our pen or into our laptop. Yeah, okay. definitely gone off the subject a little bit there. Totally not. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that was, that was too much. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. Oh, that was absolutely... <laughs> Go on the question. Spot on, spot on. I love that. I love that. I feel that that's why quite often people can struggle with the writing process because we are like trained and taught like to be up in our heads and go to the mind, yeah. you know, and there's a place for that, but we lose that sense of connection and the way you talk there about the words streaming through or connecting with our memories through the body and those like streaming through the pen. Yeah, mm. that's the most powerful and I I think it comes you know not every person who has an embodiment practice like dance or yoga or reiki or any of the other brilliant kind of body work or you know massage cranial stuff not everybody who has those practices is necessarily like oh yeah I, I want to write a book mm. but I do think that people who engage in body work practices are in a position to be able to express themselves even just privately in your own private journaling and for sure everybody ever has got a, a thinking mind which is completely relevant and is really helpful for us in life but sometimes when we want to get into those like those deeper recesses recesses recesses, recesses <laughs> of what we actually want to write about it can take a little piece of quiet a candle being lit a few deep breaths and being like, thank you, brain. I, you know, you've really served me like through a lot of my life. You've got me a degree. You've got me some A-levels. You help me out with like knowing where things are when I go to a shop. But for now, apart from my central nervous system, helping me know how to use my pen or my laptop, this is going to come from a different place. Yeah. And like, I can really feel that with this book as well, Sarah, like, just holding her in my hands I was just so because it has been a longer process than we expected to actually pass <laughs> up into the yes. world like originally we thought she was going to be a summer baby but no <laughs> no 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 <laughs> not want to come there <laughs> no no very much on her own timetable yeah yeah and it does feel perfect but mm. You know, she has been making her way into the world at this time of year, like moving into the darker months. And she feels like a kind of autumn winter. Completely. And, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, when it was looking like she wasn't going to be ready or coming out in summer and we, like you and I were emailing and I think you said something about, oh, I, I kind of get the sense that she's she's maybe for later anyway, like more autumnal. I was like, yeah, yes, yeah, definitely. And it's always, I think, part of my own writing practice is to know when I'm kind of like putting too much of my own agenda on something. Mm. I like get something to happen that isn't 
you know, nothing bad would have happened if she come out in August or no. September. That's, you know, great. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe there's ideas that a system that is so beyond our human understanding, like, you know, those mysteries that are in the universe that possibly predetermined, I don't know, but maybe they've got a better idea than our kind of usual standard human brain about what we are and our egos as well, right? About what we try and assert onto something to try and get it to happen. So yeah, it it, it was humbling to be like, oh, I can release this. I can let this drop out of my hands a little bit. You know, I can afford to, to sit back and just be like, it's going to happen when it happens. Yeah. And that's freedom because that's not something really in life that we're we're taught to do. No, again, it's like, you know, you've got to try and make things happen and like set the agenda and like, have right. a clear idea. And it's right. really powerful to have an intention and uh, you know For sure. Nice. Yeah. But like have absolutely found with a lot of these books, they definitely have their own timing and they're not gonna let anyone mess with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. And, and, and I like that, you know, I, I, I like a woman who knows who she is. <laughs> that is definitely, that's definitely enough. And just going back to a little bit of the, the subject matter of, of the book herself and how we are kind of trained to like assert our own agenda onto stuff and on our own kind of timeline, like, okay, it has to happen then. And if it doesn't, it means this and that, and I'm a bad person and I'm not capable. And all kinds of brain chatter that we map onto the things that don't necessarily turn out the way that we would have wanted them to go. It was definitely when I was writing the chapters about recovery from emotional abuse and and being in in cult groups, that was really clear for me about how much freedom I was not allowed to give the things that I was working on within those organisations. Because if you said that you were going to get something done at that time, it was basically like, come hell or high water, that thing has to happen. And if that thing didn't happen for some completely reasonable, totally fine human reason, you would then be like processed and analyzed and talked at and, you know, try to get to the bottom or what they would say, like get to the source of what the problem was that had you not do the thing that you said you weren't going to do. So imagine what a mental gymnastics, navel gazing head fuck that could be, where it's actually like, oh, it just didn't turn out. Okay, I don't have to like spend hours trying to understand why I can, you know, maybe consider it for five minutes or, you know, look at look at it again when I go back to this particular thing, this project that I I want to kind of bring about or this event that I want to have happen. (laughs) don't need to like overanalyze and process every single thing because then you can't you can't live your life like you can't actually be joyous and fulfilled and you know having a good time if you're too much tangled up in trying to find reasons for why something didn't work in the first place and so like working on those chapters it was like oh my god that has even in the years that I've been away from those groups has pervaded so much of my view of just of life like all of life like oh it's really bad that I only had like three people turn up to this event because I said that I wouldn't have had 12 and oh what was wrong with me and like where did it come from that I self-sabotaged it it's like maybe you didn't exactly think about maybe all the moving didn't. pieces like you know yeah it's not just us is it you know with yeah. you know even with our own book like that when it comes to publishing or when it comes to putting on an event you know there's like each of the possible people who could show up for yeah. that. Well, you know. Yeah. I yeah. did. It was so right. No. So right. <laughs> There's a lot of moving parts. And, you know, what what I like to do sometimes is just remind myself things that I actually don't have to beat up on myself about now that I'm not involved in those organizations. And one of those things where it's like, oh, it didn't turn out the way I wanted. Okay. No one's coming after me for it, much less I don't have to come after myself for that. Exactly. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. No, we don't have to make ourselves wrong for every tiny thing that doesn't turn out the way we... Fuck no. And you know, the, the madness of being involved in those groups is that they'll they'll tell you, they'll tell you that exact thing, like, don't make yourself wrong, but then we'll proceed in giving you a lot of techniques to analyse yourself and see how you can make yourself wrong. So again, yeah. mental gymnastics that are just there to have you become dependent on something i.e. them yeah exactly 
I love that you're speaking to that in the book, as well as like all of the different areas that you're speaking about. Um, and I know we're going to have another conversation, like probably around the springtime. Yeah. yeah, you're going to. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I'd like to um, look at exploring um, a launch event for Enough. Kind of had some ideas drop into the old brain about that already. So let's see. Um but yeah, right now, you know, it's, you know, you go to yoga class and you know that whether you've laid down for the entire session or whether you've done a few, you know, down face dogs, like it doesn't matter what you did, but you're still due the rest that comes at the end and the time to digest the hour or like 85 minutes that came before. <laughs> so I feel like that's the time now for this is like soak it up, rest and digest, let it assimilate, cook some more for the next chapter. Gorgeous. Well, I'm so glad that you're allowing that space and that that rest and integration time. Um, yeah. So often. Yeah, because what you don't get in a cult is that you're not allowed to rest. <laughs> well, no. I, <laughs> no integration. <laughs> Just keep going. But yeah, that, there can be that expectation with a book as well. Like, you know, mm. it goes out to the world and you've like got to really mm. make the most go, of go, it. Go. And it's like, no doesn't it's happen. okay just let it be yeah exactly mm. exactly oh my goodness I am so grateful that you and both of your books now are part of the Unban Press family uh, thank you such an honor to hold space for you through this process and I really am looking forward to seeing enough going out into the world and weaving her magic and mm. having mm. another conversation with you in the spring as well. We well, and thank you as well, because like publishing in, in any sense, self-publishing, hybrid publishing, big company publishing, even down to just like publishing something that a person might write and then they post it on their social media like it can be a round the bend back to front kind of process and is just apt to bring out like when I say ones I mean my like my own stuff like the messiness of those jumbled up bits that really make us very valid humans and I felt able to express those things and know that there's the space to do that and it's going to be held without somebody trying to like fix it or analyze it. And I really appreciate that. And I think that's something that women really need is the space to express, not be problem solved about who we are. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I'm so glad you experienced it like that. You know, that's my intention, our intention as a team. Mm. So, and it is, you know, the publishing process is, to be honest, often more <laughs> transformational even than the, <laughs> the writing process. Because then the writing, yeah. Like, so tender about you know going through that process of actually birthing your book so yeah it's just been like I say a complete honor to hold space for you and I'm looking forward Thank to you. seeing what's next Thank you so yes. much yes. <laughs> definitely Thank you so much You're welcome. What do you do when you want to write a book but the usual approaches are leaving you feeling restricted? pressurized, not at all enough, and pretty dry, to be honest. You find another way, of course. And if you are listening to this, my free unconventional book writing guide is going to be perfect for you. It's designed especially for soul-led coaches, healers, and mentors who want to write a transformational book without spending hours on end chained to a desk. In it, I'm giving you my unique spin on the top 10 questions I hear from would-be authors. And it's going to help you liberate the way you write forever. Download your free copy of the guide now over at nicolahumber.com slash 10, the number 10, 10 hyphen questions.